I think they came through naturally. I had wanted to write my second collection about place, but to begin with that was about leaving places behind. And I wasn't really thinking about uh, the places I was going to, but of course that seems obvious now. If you're leaving somewhere, you're going somewhere else. So the book started life as a, a sort of core of poems, which is about leaving. But then as I found myself in new places, um, the poems themselves travelled. So they became less about displacement and more about new places, replacement of self, reorientation, and about the languages needed to be in those new places, whether they be different kinds of English or new places, new ways of being in those places, or whether or not they were new languages of being there, so the Italian, for instance, to be in Italy. So um, I think that inevitably when you write a collection of poems over kind of six years, which is what this book represents, um, your starting point, both geographically and also in terms of subject, for poems linguistically perhaps, will shift within that time. And it's been really exciting for me to put the poems together in a book and see how much ground they cover, the spaces they go to. I could never have anticipated that when I started, which is a great surprise. I think as poets, we're often obsessed by language. And often that can be the language that we write in. So I write in English, I'm a monoglot English speaker. Um, but even within the confines of that, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the way that English as a language takes, uses, assimilates, reflects other linguistic systems um, and all the slippage, miscommunication, misfire, punning, jokes um, that one can achieve and experiment with even within just that one slippery body of language that is English. Um, so I think m many of us as writers were motivated to write because of the challenge of using language to express things that are difficult to express. It's, a, it's the ultimate constraint really. Um, but I because I grew up in Cornwall, um, which uh, as a place has its own language, the Cornish language, um, but I didn't really understand anything about the Cornish language, its history or its structure, um, its relationship to that place until I moved to Wales. Um, and it wasn't until I lived in a bilingual nation, a nation in which language is protected by law, uh, that I realised what I had missed where I'd come from. Um, and that was revelatory, but also incredibly sad. Um, so it was through living in Wales and learning Welsh, both formally but also informally, um, that I came to understand more about one of the languages of the places I had left behind. Um, and poetry is a fantastic medium to explore the connections between words, between ideas, but also the separateness between them. So once you're using the space on the page, you can really show or express uh, the gaps between things that are both personal gaps but linguistic gaps and historical gaps. So I couldn't have written about some of these themes, uh, it, I don't think, in any other media really than poetry. very much enjoy giving voices uh, to inanimate objects and also all sorts of other things in life that uh, we don't normally think of as having voices or being able to, to voice their experiences. And with uh, my Morrison shopping trolley poem, um, the, when you go to Morrison's and you get hold of your trolley, on the handle it says, please don't take me away from Morrison's, or at least it did at the time when I was a regular Morrison's shopper in Aldersworth. And um, I thought that that was a, an incredibly strange thing that Morrison's the chain had sort of created a situation where the shopping trolley was said to be speaking to the customer. Um, and I also thought that if I was a shopping trolley, that's the last thing I would say. I would say, get me out of here. I don't want to keep going around the shop. Um, so finding that text on the handle was a kind of prompt or a challenge. 
And I think that the world is full of, of those kind of moments where it presents you with a voice or a text. Um, you just have to be ready to see it and to think about it and often to challenge what you're finding. So um, I'm often, I'm primed for those moments and when I see them I will write them down and I'll keep them. Um, and I'll often come back to them sometimes years later. And I think with that shopping trolley poem, it was as well as the striking moment of seeing the text on the handle and, and feeling that like that was a challenge. It coincided with the point where I was getting ready to leave Aberystwyth, which is a place I'd lived for 13 years. And you know, I felt I was very happy there. Even though it was, it was time to move, I, I was feeling really very conflicted about whether or not to go and who who I would be if I didn't live there anymore. That, my sense of self was really bound up with being there. Um, so that poem about uh, leaving, about wanting to go, although it's in the voice of this shopping trolley, it's it's also exploring a lot of the things that, um, that I was kind of wrestling with at that time. Uh, and the last line you know, is that the trick is not to look back. And that's really what I was telling myself at that time, even though in many ways this whole collection, we could be anywhere right now, is one long act of looking back, even as you look forward. So I think the trick is to look back and then to write about it, <laughs> basically. So inspiration for poems, the ones that that seem particularly rooted in the everyday and kind of small moments. Uh, I am uh, a terrible eavesdropper and I think lots of writers are. So again, it's about this idea of being kind of primed and ready for things. So um, I love traveling by train and when I'm on a train, I am listening all the time. Uh, kind of a magpie who listens and takes the shiny bits of conversations. Um, and I'm, I'm terribly nosy, but I'm also, I think, very good at looking like I'm not listening. So my poem, um, You Have To Be Easy Going To Be A Susan, that title is something one woman said to another on the train, and I just wrote it down. And these two women had uh, got talking on the train um, as strangers and had found this amazing thing that they have the same name. But unfortunately, they have so little other things in common, and they were desperately trying to find more um, as one of them was getting off the train. and. Uh, what an incredible uh, thing to have the privilege to listen to. Um, it was so bizarre, but also so rich. And many of the lines in the poem, it's a fan poem, I guess, are just taken from them. And I'm doing that all the time. And that's actually a poem in the end where I felt I really had to acknowledge my own place in the poem. So the last line is, um, you know, Susan's going talking, Catherine's are listening, um, because that is what I'm doing. And I feel like if anyone's sitting next to me, the train is, is uh, liable to end up in the poem. But I, I, uh, I, I have always done that and I find it um, incredibly rich, often working from a starting point that somebody gives you, or I take from them I should say, that is in the air and I take hold of it. Actually sometimes just writing that down on the page means that it takes on a resonance and my brain starts firing and I pull things together around it that if I was working without that prompt I would never do. So I'm incredibly grateful for noisy people on trains. I love them. Uh, I, I would have no problem with my novels and my poems sort of coming together. I don't feel that they need to be separate, it's best to be separate, but they are separate and they uh, always have been. Um, even though in some ways I write about similar themes, so I've written a series of novels, historical crime novels set in Cornwall that explore Cornish history, real events, folklore, and in this new collection, uh, poetry collection we could be anywhere by now, I am writing about things in, in that happened in Cornwall about Cornwall, but they're so different that you could read them and not realise they were by the same person. And I'm not really sure why that is, but they must be scratching different itches. They must be doing different things for what I want to say. Um, and I don't really know. I don't really know how to kind of express that or even understand it. And. Uh, that's something I'm quite happy for other people to uh, write about and tell me about.
that relationship between my poems and prose because for me they're like it's like a different person gets up in the morning and writes one or the other and I actually have two quite separate groups of readers so the people who read my fiction and my includes fantasy now fantasy fiction often never know that I'm a poet would never read those texts and vice versa um, the Venn diagram of people who read both is quite, <laughs> quite narrow um, so um, I must be just, in some ways, speaking different languages, I think, um, and I'm not sure why that is. I read widely in both both mediums, I always have, I teach in both, I'm fascinated by both, and yet, in terms of writing, they seem to diverge, um, which is fascinating, but also quite baffling. Um, so, I like the fact with, with poetry, as opposed to fiction, there's an expectation that you can do work slowly, and that's okay. Sort of culturally acceptable and nobody minds if you've got 10 years between poetry books but in fiction that's completely different and there is a an expectation that things will be done more quickly and so i think i get a lot from the different pace of poetry and the different expectations of the poetry world in terms of publication that's a, a different space and i gain a lot from that in terms of um resilience uh, when in the fiction world things are often quite frenetic um which can be wonderful but much more stressful actually in the poetry world so I think just in terms of time they help me work in different ways and for that 